are my protector and you are my provider and my deliverer. There's no other help by Stevie B's Media Production presents What a Word from the Lord with your host, Stevie R. Butler. This radio show is dedicated to spreading the truth of God's Word, rightly dividing the word of truth. Feel free to give us a call at 713-955-0508. If you would like to email us your questions or comments or concerns, you can do that at srbutler1009 at yahoo.com. You can also contact me at my business line, Carolina Studio at 910-425-1922. Now again, this show is brought to you by loving and faithful members of the churches of Christ around the world. If you need help locating the congregation in your area, please email us or give us a call. And we'll be happy to assist you. Again, take out your Bibles and follow along with us here on What a Word from the Lord with your host, Stevie R. Butler. radio broadcast. Stevie B's Media Production presents What a Word from the Lord with your host, Stevie R. Butler. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to apologize. At the beginning of the broadcast, I, I was notified that my music went dead on me, but the music was fine. My mic was, was not on. <laughs> I was talking, but my mic was not live, so I didn't realize that after I'd finished saying what I had to say and looked up and everything was already did okay so we, we're on the air now we're ready to go thank you all for tuning in to the broadcast ladies and gentlemen i just want to give you a word from the lord but before we go into the program let us go to god in a word of prayer that we may thank him for this opportunity 
Our most kind, gracious, loving Heavenly Father, the Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for blessing us to go through the various activities of the day and placing it on our hearts that we are on this broadcast at this point in time. And we are prepared now to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Pray that you will be with my guest speakers on the broadcast, be with uh, those who are in the community corner and my co-hosts as well as they present a portion of your holy and divine word. Father, we pray that you will be with our listeners who are tuning into this broadcast. We pray that they may listen well and that they will hear something on this broadcast that will cause them to consider their eternal stance before you and their soul salvation. Father, we thank you so much for the love that you had and that you was willing to send your only begotten son to this world to live an example of how, show us an example of how we are supposed to live and then to give up his life on that cruel cross of Calvary. We recognize without such a sacrifice, we would not even have a hope of eternal life. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless us and keep us and love us all the days of our lives. And that we have been faithful unto death. Father, we pray that you would save us. For it's in Christ's name we do ask it all. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. What a word from the Lord. I'm your host, Stevie R. Butler. And we have a great show lined up for you on tonight. We have my guest speaker in the first segment, Steve Cordo. He's been on the broadcast before. He did such a great job. And I have him in my rotation, ladies and gentlemen, because I know that brother is going to rightly divide the word of truth. And we have a, my guest in the community corner, Chef Brian Brown from Atlanta, Georgia. We're looking forward to hearing what uh, Chef Brian Brown is Brown Brown is doing in Atlanta. He's going to tell us about his business in Atlanta. And in the third segment, my co-host Edward Bishop will be bringing us a lesson from God's Word, and I'll be closing out the broadcast with a lesson from God's Word as well. So thank you all for tuning in to What a Word from the Lord. I'm your host, Stevie R. Butler. After this song, the next voice you hear will be that of my special guest, Steve Cordo. Thank you for tuning in to the broadcast. Come on, y'all, let's gather around. That is why we come to this house. There is nothing better to do. So we're gonna cut loose and sing for you. We're gonna harmonize and we're gonna shout. We're gonna sing, we're gonna tell you what you're living about. I'm gonna tell you. I don't know about but I gotta cut loose and sing myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, y'all, and grab you up on. There's no better way for us to start. We'll sing them fast and we'll sing them slow. So get off the seat and just let go. We're gonna 
special guest speaker, Steve Cordo, and his subject, God is Able. Well, thank you for this uh, invitation once again to be with you, uh, Brother Stevie. I appreciate being in the rotation. And uh, for those in the audience, if you wouldn't mind turning on over to Daniel chapter 3, and while you're doing that, uh, just think for a minute about some of the decisions we make every day. Uh, Every day we have to choose between options. Uh, For instance, this morning when that alarm clock went off, you got to make a decision. Do I get up or do I reach over and slap that snooze button for another 10 minutes? And then once we make choices, consequences follow. Now, we usually tend to think of consequences as being negative, but they can be positive. When I roll out of bed in the morning and I go into work and do my job, I get paid for it, and then I can provide all the things that my family needs. That's a good consequence. If I decide, nah, I think I'm just going to let the job go and, and not support my family, well, then some bad consequences are going to follow. But life is just a series of choices and the consequences that follow each choice. Now, we always have to make choices from one minute to the next. For instance, you made a choice to turn into this broadcast, and and I really hope it'll be a blessing to you. And You know, when you choose to get up this morning, you decided what to wear, what you're going to eat. And have you ever stopped to think about our choices as they relate to God? In other words, before I make a choice, I should always stop and ask, is this the right choice? Is this road that I'm going to put myself on by making this choice going to bring me closer to God, make me a better servant to God? Or is it maybe a choice that's going to lead me away? Now, with that in mind, I want you to think also about how sometimes the choices we make can put us in some awkward situations. 
they can lead us into situations that we just aren't prepared for and that can may be dangerous sometimes. You know, if you think back about a month or so ago, uh, President Trump said he would have gone into the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School unarmed and confronted Nicholas Cruz. Now, it's easy to say that after the fact in that kind of a situation. It's easy to say, well, hey, if I was in that situation, I would have done whatever. In fact, have you ever noticed how after an event, the armchair quarterbacks come out of the woodwork saying what they would have done? Every time there's a steep stock market correction, my mailbox fills up with all these financial planners who claim to have predicted it. But what if instead of facing an active shooter in a school, though, you are facing a hostile government that's demanding you give up your faith or face death? Because that's what the people in the Bible did. Now, for many Christians, we've read these accounts so many times, they become just stories to us. We don't stop to think, what if that really was me? We like to look at the pages of the Bible and the people in them as some kind of superman or superwoman. They're able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. They're stronger than a locomotive, faster than a speeding bullet, and all that sort of thing. But when you look at the biblical record, one thing is clear. The people we read about were just as human as you or I. In fact, I used to picture Bible characters with all the personality of a Ben Stein character. Uh, if you remember Ben Stein, he was the, the teacher in Ferris Bueller's Day Off and was the teacher who showed up occasionally in the Wonder Years, very monotonic when he talked. And that's how I pictured Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount, Behold, the birds of the air. And then one day I was reading James chapter 5, and I had read this many times, and something finally occurred to me. Chapter 5, verse 7, hold your finger there, Daniel 3, we're coming back to it, but I want to point out Daniel cha or, uh, James chapter 5, verse 17. The New King James says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. And the earth produced its fruit. Now, the NIV says, has, says it even better. Elijah was a man just like us. And that jumped off the page at me. For instance, he's a man just like me. Have you, let me ask you this. He's a man just like you. Have you ever felt fear, anger? Have you ever been frustrated? Well, we all have. In fact, in our Wednesday night Bible class where I preach, we've been looking at the book of Numbers, and I really be am beginning to notice all the times in this study Moses got so fed up with Israel, so frustrated with Israel, to the point of being afraid of the people. He was angry. He was tired. Does that sound like you and me? In the days of World War II, the 82nd Airborne Division defined courage as when you feel the fear, but you go anyway. You jump out of a perfectly good airplane at 10,000 feet. That takes courage. And that's what it takes to do what's right in the eyes of God. And that's what's happening here in Daniel 3. Remember, these men are like Elijah. They're feeling the fear. They're feeling the, the, the uh, uh, blood, blood uh, uh, you know, picking up and going fast, the heart rate, the excitement. And I want us to notice some things. Daniel chapter 3, I want us to notice that sometimes we have to speak truth to power. Look at them in the face of authority. They spoke truth to power. Look at verses 1 through 15. You know, I used to have a misconception about this incident until I started studying for this talk. I had it in my head that the entire population of the Babylonian Empire was assembled. But notice verses 2 through 7, where there it makes it pretty clear it's the political appointees of the king. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image of King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So see who's been called. And so the satraps, we're going on to verse 3, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image the king, that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So these are the political appointees. And uh, one source I looked at said that this reflects Nebuchadnezzar's policy of appointing native rulers to govern the processes. So I, I live in Florida. 
So let's say Florida goes up and invades Georgia. We would take local people from where we've invaded and appoint them to rule over in our behalf. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar has done here. I had always thought of this as a religious test that Nebuchadnezzar was applying. But when I look at this, at who's assembled, and I look at the punishment for not obeying, to be cast into a furnace, this looks to me more like it's a test of political loyalty. And all leaders prize loyalty, especially political leaders. That's one thing I've learned. I've read several books analyzing the 2016 presidential election, and that's one thing that's come out is both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump place a premium on loyalty. And I grew up in Alaska, and our governor once got appointed by Richard Nixon to be Secretary of the Interior. That was Wally Hickel. Well, after the Kent State shootings in 1970, Hickel made some uh, – wrote a letter to the president that somehow became public. And Nixon took it as a sign of disloyalty, and Hickel was the first uh, of Nixon's cabinet to be fired uh, for what was perceived as disloyalty. It is a premium that leaders place on uh, their their subordinates, especially when they go up the, net, the uh, political ladder. And Nebuchadnezzar is no different. He wants to know who's on my side, especially since so many of these appointees, like these three Hebrews, are not Babylonians. They're natives to other areas. So was, so was this an uh, idol a test aimed just at the Hebrews? Can't say for certain. We know that in Daniel chapter 6, that was aimed specifically at Daniel. That was a, a setup. Oh, speaking of Daniel, where was he while everyone is commanded to worship the golden image? Well, I've got a really deep theological answer for that. You ready? Here it is. I don't know. Nobody knows where Daniel was at that time. And critics who question the authenticity of the book of Daniel point to the omission of his name as evidence that uh, this is just some legend. But really, the research I did looks that he was probably excused for some reason. We don't know why, but, uh, but apparently he was. But Nebuchadnezzar, getting back to him, is not happy with the report about the Hebrews. He orders them to be brought before him. And James Burton Kaufman pointed out that despite his rage and fury, Nebuchadnezzar refused to act against the Jews without an investigation. He perhaps was aware of the vicious jealousy that prompted the charges. Therefore, the king gave the Hebrews another chance to clear themselves of the charges. Now, I've never thought of a ruthless autocrat like uh, Nebuchadnezzar as being interested in due process or fundamental fairness. But it seems as though he wants to hear their side of the story. Hey, come on, guys. What's going on? Why are you not bowing down? I I've heard that you're not doing it. Uh, come on. Explain yourself. What's happening here? Now, it could be that these people who reported them still have an axe to grind. Back in Daniel chapter 2, remember, is where uh, Daniel and his uh, friends were appointed uh, to, over the affairs of the province of Babylon in chapter 2, verse 49. So these it could be just feeling some jealousy here. They accuse the three Jewish leaders, but look at verses 8 through 12, where, where they are going to uh, uh, own up to their own devotion. You know, at the uh, verse 8, therefore at the time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and um, psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship will be cast in the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Well, there are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. So they're pointing it out, kind of, hey, look what they're doing. And we're, we're doing right, but look what they're doing. But now go back and remember what James said about Elijah, that he was a man just like us. And I have no doubt that these three men were feeling some kind of fear or apprehension or anxiety. But notice, they're going to go anyway. They're going to take their stand for the Lord. 
Now, did these informants actually witness the trio not bowing down, or did maybe someone turn them in? Well, we, again, we don't know. But the people who brought these charges, you notice, are the nobles, not just astrologers. And that's uh, according to what the Aramaic term used here is. And the king, you notice, is confronting these men. Is this true? That you won't worship the god that I have erected or the statue that I have erected? What's going on? Now, under American law, treason is very narrowly defined, and that's a deliberate act by our founders. But in those days, well, treason was pretty much whatever the king said it was. And so Nebuchadnezzar could call this treason, and even if he didn't, he's certainly taking it personal that these three Hebrews will not bow down. So at least in this case, he's got a sense of fairness, though, because he does want them to speak for themselves. But look at verse 16. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. Now, if I was to translate this into modern American English, I think they'd be saying something like, that's rhetorical, right? I mean, come on, you know our answer. We don't, we're, we're not going to debate you on this. They're speaking truth to power. They are not going to debate. They are simply going to stand for what they know is right. And they've decided to do this despite the consequences. And that brings us to, to a part where basically the king is going to say, I dare you. Now it's the king's turn. They've stated their, what they're going to do. They've stated their position. So now the king is basically going to dare them. You remember the flagpole scene in that movie, The Christmas Story, where the character Schwartz is daring Flick to put his tongue on a frozen metal flagpole? By the way, I grew up in Alaska. Your tongue will stick to it if you, if you do try that. But the narrator says, the proper protocol for this ritual was to dare, then double dog dare, triple dare you, and then triple dog dare you. But Schwartz skipped the triple dare and went right for the jugular, a triple dog dare. That's basically what Nebuchadnezzar's done here. He's gone right for a triple dog dare, daring these young men to be faithful to their God. He's not happy as he's questioning them. He is angry, demanding that they prove their innocence. One writer said that in situations like this, no crime is greater than nonconformity. Yet that is exactly what God asks of us when these things of the world are arrayed against the things of God. Many, many years later, the Apostle Paul is going to tell the Roman church in chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And notice verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's a major issue for us today as Christians. There are a lot of people who want to give Jesus their hearts, but they don't want to give Jesus anything else. They want to live life their own way. They want to act their own way. Sure, I'll give Jesus that hour or those two hours on Sunday morning, maybe even Sunday night, but the rest of the week, oh, that's mine. I'll live it any way I want. But Romans 12, Paul is saying, look, don't just give Jesus your heart. He wants more than that. He wants all of you. He wants your mind. He wants your actions. He wants your body. He wants everything. Kind of reminds me of the old story where the young man goes to his girlfriend's father and says, sir, I'd like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And he looks at him and says, young man, you will take all of her or nothing. And that's exactly what Paul is saying here. Jesus wants all of you or nothing. One writer understood that this is a very in, in a very intense and personal way. He once wrote that we are not our own, therefore neither is our own reason or will to rule our acts and counsels. We are not our own. Therefore, let us not make it our end to seek what may be agreeable to our carnal nature. We are not our own. Therefore, as far as possible, let us forget ourselves and the things that are ours. That comes from a 15th century uh, theologian. In Daniel chapter 3, notice verse 17. If that is the case, O God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. So he's daring them. 
basically he wants to know, do they really love their God enough that they're going to go through with this? And, do you, and he, let's ask ourselves, do we love God enough to take a risk for his sake? Because unwavering faith is the faith that we have in good times. Well, what about in bad times? It's easy for me to have faith in God and, and tell you to have faith in God. Every Sunday morning, every preacher gets up and tells the congregation to have faith in God. But then what happens when things do get bad? When you get that bad news diagnosis from the doctor, when you see that horrific accident, when you lose your job and maybe on the verge of losing your house, can we really have faith that no matter comes, we will still stand with God? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego evaluated their losses and calculated their gains and concluded that even if they chose the truth, they still had to take the dare. But they believed that their actions were more reflective of the truth concerning themselves. See, these these three men chose to have faith in God despite consequences. They were willing to lay everything on the line. They were they they told the king that God is going to deliver us from the fire. And even if he didn't, well, he's still able to do so. But even if we don't come out of the fire, we'll go home to be with God. See, we never know what God can do until we really step out on faith. The conquered says, I should have, could have, would have. But the conqueror says, I thought I could, I think I can, I did it, I knew I could. So you'll never know what you can do until you actually step out and put your faith in God. And as I was reading this, I thought of Paul's words to the Philippians when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, if God wants me to stay here and continue my ministry, that's great. But if he calls me home, hey, that's great, even better, because now I get to go home and be with the Lord. <clears throat> here's, here's a question. What are you living for? How would you fill in this blank? For me to live is, fill in the blank. For me to live is what? And to die is, fill in the blank. For me to die is what? For me to live is money, but to die is to leave it all behind. For me to live is fame, and to die is to be forgotten. For me to live is power, and to die is to lose it all. Paul knew that both his living and dying were the decision of God's will, his sovereign will. To die would not be a tragedy, but instead a realization of Paul's hope and his expectations. On the one hand, death would be a release from the toils and troubles of this life. Death would be the gateway to Christ's presence. But to live, Paul would continue his ministry. Had a lady one time, she lived to be 104, and she told me uh, just before her 100th birthday, I'm ready to go or stay, whatever God wants. And do, can we say that? See, if you're living for anything else but Christ, you've got nothing to look forward to. You're just going uh, to have a miserable life and an even more miserable eternity. While reading and preparing for this lesson, I read a story that first appeared in Leadership Journal several years ago, about 2002, about a man named Dr. Paul Bram. He became a resident in a new retirement home, and he was asked to speak at its dedication. Now, most people know Dr. Bram through his best-selling book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. But that day, he said something that stirred my soul when I first heard. This is what the writer said um, who was writing this article. So I remember well when uh, Dr. Brand said, I remember well when I was in my physical peak. I was about 27 years old and had just finished medical school. A group of friends and I were mountain climbing, and we would, could climb for hours. For some people, when they cross that peak, for them, life is over. But I remember my mental peak, too. I was 57 years of age and was performing groundbreaking hand surgery. All of my medical training was coming together in one place. For some people, when they cross this peak, for them, life is over. I'm now over 80 years of age. I recently realized I'm approaching another peak, my spiritual peak. All I have sought to become as a person has the opportunity to come together in wisdom, maturity, kindness, love, joy, and peace. And I realize when I cross that peak, for me, life will not be over. It will have just begun. And that's the way it is for the one who lives for Christ. Your life is not over when you reach your physical peak. It's not over when you reach a mental peak. Your life is not over when you reach your spiritual peak at the end, for it, then it's just beginning of a great and grand existence in heaven with the Lord. 
So the king now, if we come back to that, is daring them. They've got to make a choice. Are we going to go into that fiery furnace or are we going to bow down to this image? They've got to make that choice. They've spoken truth to power. Now here's where we're going to see God is able, or as I like to call it, I won't back down. Look at verses 19 to 23. Now here's an important point to remember. You watch some of these TV preachers, the health, uh, or what is it, the prosperity gospel. You'll be healthy and wealthy if you just become a Christian. Your problems will be at an end. But you notice that's nowhere taught in the scripture. In fact, if you look at this example we have here, the important point to remember is this. God did not take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the furnace. He, they did lose their uh, – they were unbound in there. But they still had to stay, go through the furnace. The purpose of the furnace was to burn up that which had them in bondage. And what's the great line? Sometimes instead of calming the storm, God lets the storm rage and he calms us. In Daniel chapter 3, you notice God did not extinguish the flames. He didn't even keep them out of the furnace. He let them go through the furnace and in turn calm the Hebrews. Now, can you think of a moment in your life when you wished you had stood firm but you did not? And when that happened, you notice it leaves us with an ache in our soul. Oh, why didn't I say this? You know, how could I have been so foolish? You know, why didn't I st uh, stand up and say, no, this is wrong? I knew I should never have accepted that offer or signed those papers. How many of us have got regrets like that? Or we wish we had made a stronger stand for the Lord and not back down. In Jude 24, we are told to contend for the faith. And that word for contend is found only in Jude 24, but in Greek secular literature, it was used to describe the intense struggle in an athletic event. Think of a wrestling match. Oh, and while you're at it, remember that Paul said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers? Have you noticed other analogies that are used throughout Scripture, like fight the good fight, put on the armor of God? You know, what do we use armor for? For battle. We don't use it for a Sunday uh, picnic. You see, Christianity is going to be a struggle. I've never said that he was going to uh, uh, give us a struggle-free life. In Daniel chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar is basically saying to these three men, look, you owe me. After all I've done for you, I didn't even have to give you another chance. Now the, la the least you can do is just fall in line, go along with the plan, and if you don't, I guarantee you will suffer for standing against me. So hey, uh, guys, come on. Let's just put this behind us and show we're all on the same team. Let's just bow down when you hear the music and, and be on your way, and, and uh, you know we'll, 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 we'll forget this happened. But you notice those Hebrews, they never ask for just a minute, hey, excuse us, king, we're going to go over here in the corner and talk about it and confer, uh, or excuse me, King, we need to call our preacher or some other spiritual advisor. They didn't do that. They just turned around and gave their answer. What would happen if they burned in the fire? Well, I think we'd still be holding them in high esteem as a model for people to follow, that they went through, they, they, they backed their faith up with action. People would remember those guys that took a stand, even one that caused their death. And they've gone on to a much better reward. Do know that if they had compromised, we wouldn't be talking about them today. I don't think there would be they would be remembered at all if they had chosen to uh, to compromise. We would not still be talking about them all these many years later. Now, here's another thing to remember: there's always somebody watching to see what decisions you are going to make in life. Coworkers, spouse, children. If you're a parent, I've got a four-year-old. And I'm always reminded just about every day how she's watching me and how I have to watch my conduct. I need to behave like a Christian so that one day she will be a Christian too. Remember, you're being watched by total strangers. You're standing in line at Walmart. Uh, there's people watching you. What, what does your conduct say? Does it say that you have a faith that is, that is worth sharing, something to believe in like these three Hebrews did? You ever thought about the possibility of going to heaven and discovering how many people might come up to you and say, thank you? I saw you take a stand at school that time or at the party or on the job. 
you know, there's a lot of debate, or at least there used to be, about wearing T-shirts that advertise Jesus or have scripture on them. And I've known people who didn't like that, thought it was it was demeaning to scripture or to the Lord. But for me personally, when I wear a T-shirt that's got advertises the fact that I'm a Christian, I have a reminder to watch my conduct. I'm basically a walking billboard announcing to the world that I'm a Christian. So if I go into a restaurant and my order isn't quite right and I blow up and make a scene, I've just blown any uh, testimony uh, for Christ. I've just blown my example. But with that T-shirt on, it reminds me, hey, I'm a Christian. i got to handle this problem in a Christ-like manner. People are going to be watching me. Remember, Jesus told us to go out and teach about him throughout the whole earth. And one of the ways we teach is by our actions, every time we take a stand for him. And today we all stand for something. If it's not Jesus, then what are you standing for? You may not ever have to stand against a Nebuchadnezzar who's threatening you with your life, but you may still have to make a stand against uh, some coworkers who are telling dirty jokes. Maybe a boss that wants you to do something unethical. You have to take a stand. And it may bring you acceptance and position today to back down and go with the flow, but it won't be any help when you leave this world and you enter the next. Don't forget, your stands today determine what you will be doing not only later in your life, but also in heaven. You know, the way to look at this is how television many times presents uh, the scenarios of the superhero in a life or death situation, hanging off a cliff. Uh, and a, uh, it's about to, to go over. Now, we know the superhero is going to be rescued. We know that the character isn't going get, to get killed off because that's going to end the series. But in the case of these young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, no one knew that they would be rescued. But they knew that God was able to bring them through. Have you ever found yourself in a circumstance, in a situation where you wondered – is God really able to deliver me? Now, in this passage, help was needed. And if help was needed, then we need to make sure we ask God for help. When you find yourself in those situations, ask God for help. Ask brethren to pray for you and to pray with you. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were tied up and tossed into that fire. But the word of God reveals that when we choose God, when we choose to place our faith above our fear, then the power of God will be in the midst of that fiery furnace, whatever it is for us, that situation. Whether it's a bad financial situation, a bad health situation, whatever it is, God will be there. Remember, God sent Jesus to be our, our uh, salvation, to bring us salvation on the cross, because he knew we could not get ourselves out of that furnace. While we were still enemies, Christ died for us. He went to the cross. God will take care of you if your hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I shall not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Hope you found this lesson to be a blessing. I hope it will give you courage. If when you're in a situation like this, you will have the courage to stand just like these three did. And uh, thank you, Brother Butler, for the opportunity once again. These are the announcements for the events and activities in the Churches of Christ. If you would like to have your events or activities announced on this broadcast, please contact me at 910-425-1922 or send me an email to srbutler1009 at yahoo.com. On October the 1st through the 4th, 2018, the Southeastern Lectureship 2018 hosted by the West Oak Grove Church of Christ. And that address is 3455 Highway 51 South, Hernando, Mississippi, 38632. For hotel information and registration, please contact the ministering evangelist Terry D. Wallace Sr. at telephone number 662-449-4191. On May the 26th through the 28th, 2018, the Southside Church of Christ Homecoming 2018 there will be a gospel concert, a cappella concert, on Saturday, May 26th at 4 p.m., featuring Total Praise, Revelation a cappella, Genesis, and Live. And on Sunday, May 27th, the worship service will begin at 10.30 a.m., and there will be a program at 3.30 p.m. 
on April the 6th through the 8th, 2018, the 50th Reunion Northeastern Youth Conference will be held at Newark Church of Christ, and that address is 723 Clinton Avenue and South 14th Street in Newark, New Jersey. The evangelist is Dr. Eugene Lawson. For information, please give him a call at 973-374-4563. On May the 19th through the 24th, 2018, the 2018 Churches of Christ National Lectureship, the theme of this lectureship will be the exposition on the race by faith. And the text used will be Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hosted by the ministering evangelist Jefferson Carruthers at the Carver Road Church of Christ in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. The area, local congregations in that area in the Triad, Greensboro, High Point, and Winston-Salem will also be sponsoring this event. The event will be held at the Connery Convention Center of the Sheraton at Four Seasons, and that address is 3121 West Hate City Boulevard, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27407. More information, please give them a call. 336 292 9161. On April the 6th and 7th, 2018, the West Coast Regional Teachers Workshop. And their theme will be Connecting God's Word to God's Word. And the time will be Friday, 7 p.m., and Saturday morning at 8 o'clock a.m. The address will be the Normandy Church of Christ, 6306 Normandy Avenue, Los Angeles, California. The registration will be $30, including breakfast and workshop material. On August the 34th through September the 3rd, the Woodlawn Forest Church of Christ will be hosting the 87th Annual Homecoming and Empowerment Conference. And that theme will be moving from anticipation to sanctification. And the address is 1515 North Forest Street, Valdosta, Georgia, 313601. And the website is www.west, www.woodlawnforest.com. For more information, please give them a call at 229-242-7228. And the ministry and evangelist is Leroy Butler Jr. And this will conclude our announcements. I was hurting all alone I was searching for a comfort I could find on my own With no direction Feeling down My life was headed for disaster Till you turned me around Trying to please me, it only pleased me less. But when I learned about the way that you love me, had to put your honor above me, and you gave me rest. Lead me to rest, sweet Lord. Lead me to rest oh, from my journey. As I consider what you offered me, how can it be real? What should I offer in return? When the value of your blessings no one could ever, ever earn. Then you tell me that I'm really forgiven. Got a reason for And you made it so clear, yeah. I'm supported when the devil would charm me. 
Protected when evil would harm me Tell me how can I be Lead me to rest with Lord Lead me to rest From my journey here Lead me to rest The relief I find From the burden that I'm wearing Listening to What a Word from the Lord with your host Stevie R. Butler. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the new segment on the broadcast called the Community Corner. And what this is, you know, sometimes people come to the church looking for help, and sometimes we have to tell them, well, that's not a work of the church. And that might be the case in some cases, but not always. But we don't really tell them where they need to go to get the help that they need. And this is the basis for this Community Corner. This segment is designed to just tell our listeners just what products and services are available to them. So the people who are in this segment of the broadcast are just on here telling us about their small business or what uh, business they have and what products and services they're offering to the communities in which they live. And they also will tell us how to contact them for their services. So we just want to make the saints aware of what's going on and what's available to them, because there are a lot of people in our congregations who are doing uh, uh, great works within their communities, and we just don't have the information about what's going on around us. And that's the, uh, the reasoning behind this portion of the broadcast. And in the community corner on this evening, we have my good dear brother, Chef Brian Brown. How you doing, my brother? I'm doing great, my brother. Good to be on here. I'm glad to have you on here. Now, I was supposed to have Chef Brian Brown on my Friday night show a few weeks ago. Right. And we're still trying to make that happen. We're going to make it happen, Doc. (laughs) All right. Well, why don't you go ahead and tell us about what it is that you're doing in Atlanta, Georgia, regarding your business? Well, of course, everybody knows that I am the chef. And uh, what I do is uh, I am a two-part business. I am a private chef as well as I have my own catering business. And the name of the catering business is called Brown's Keynote Catering. And I use the keynote because somebody took the singing chef. (laughs) So I use Brown's Keynote Catering. Uh, My brothers and I, of course, have been singing for more than 30 years. Uh, together and and so uh, I've also been 
a chef for nearly 30 years. And so um, I've just been doing it that way for a long time. And um, what I do here in Atlanta, and, and actually I also travel as well because I've been summoned to several places to go and, and cook and uh, do some private engagements as well as doing catering events uh, for some folks, and that is in the church as well. Uh, I also have ventured into another part of the business, and that is teaching our youth uh, at church. Uh, it's not exclu- exclusive to just the church kids, but it's the basis is done through the church. And I work through the Hillcrest Church of Christ right now, and uh, it's all to benefit the church. And like you said in your segment uh, when you was introducing it, uh, that uh, we don't know where to go and find certain things. We don't know where to find a personal chef or where, where to find a, a caterer that is, you know, good enough to do these things. Now, I'm a trained uh, chef. I attended the Le Cordon Bleu Culinary School, and uh, I have a degree in culinary arts. And so uh, I've been doing it for some time now, and I have an extensive uh, uh, resume. I've been up and down uh, the U.S., of uh, the eastern part of the U.S., and I've cooked in Oklahoma and did that cattle thing out there. And, of course, being from the Miami area, seafood is in my blood. So I teach uh, the the kids on those bases as well and teach them the basic fundamentals of cooking. And I found that we have a lot of youth in the church that want to pursue being chefs. Now, 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 Chef Brian Brown, is there a special dish you uh, specialize in? (laughs) You know, I get asked that a lot. And I always say, whatever you want. I specialize in it. But as far as me, uh, something uh, that I like to do for myself and maybe my family is I love doing seafood, of course, uh, being from the east coast of Florida and spending time on the west coast of Florida. So, you know, the water is my life, man, and I, I love I love playing with the, with the fishies, as I always say. All right. Say. <laughs> why don't you tell why don't you tell my listeners how they can get in contact with you? I can be reached if you're on Facebook, I can be reached at uh with Chef Brian Brown. That's B R I A N, last name Brown, B R O W N. That's Chef Brian Brown. I can be found on Facebook and you can see some of my uh dishes on there. Uh I can also be reached uh by email uh at chef dot brian brown at yahoo dot com and of course my phone number uh six seven eight three zero eight five eight eight nine if you want to contact me immediately. All right. Now was there anything else you wanted to let us know before I let you go? Oh uh, just hey I'm just so thankful to be on here and I appreciate you bringing me on and uh we gonna get that straightened out so we can uh, be able to come on and me and my brother be able to come on and, and do some real talking with you. Yeah, man. I'm looking forward to the Friday night show. You know, I, I get to let my hair down on Friday night. I know it. I know it. So we looking forward <laughs> to that. All right, my brother. I certainly appreciate you coming in and sharing your uh, your business with us here on the Community Corner. Appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you, too, sir. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, after we come back from the break, the next voice you hear will be that of my co-host as he presents us a lesson from God's Word. Stay tuned to What a Word from the Lord. I know.
listening to What a Word from the Lord with your host, Stevie R. Butler. Now my co-host, Edward Bishop, and his subject, God's Plan. I would like to, first of all, like to thank Brother Butler for giving me this opportunity to stand for you all this evening to present to you a lesson from God and grafted word. More importantly, Bob Ball, I don't think that God is heaven for giving me the strength and the ability uh, to be able to stand before you all this evening. For it is in him that we live, we move, and we have our very being. We are because he is. Our illness is simply wrapped up in his isness. Now, having said that, if you have your copy of God's engrafted word, uh, which is able to save our very soul, God's basic instructions before leaving this earth, the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 37 through 47. That's the book of Acts, second chapter, verses 37 through 47. I shall not be long on this evening. Acts, the second chapter. Verse number 37 through 40. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Simon and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Promise is unto you and to all the children and to all those that are far off, even as many as our Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, he did testify and exalt, saying, Save yourself from this untowered generation. And they that, were, and they that gladly received this word were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, and the breaking of bread and the prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted itself all to men. As even as every man had need, and they continued daily with hoarding in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having faith with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as were being saved. I want to speak as the Spirit shall God with the thought on our mind. God's math, is that right? God's math plan. The book of Acts is known as the book of conversion. The book of Acts is known as the history of the church. Uh, because this is where the church is first introduced. This is where the first gospel sermon of facts was preached. This is where Peter and the rest of the apostles stood up boldly and proclaimed that those people that were there 
Isaiah, that they murdered and killed the messianic master. And after they heard of what they did, they asked that all important question what must we do in order bold apostles? He stood up, you know, Peter, the one who always managed to put his foot in his mouth. The one who always got himself in trouble. The one who denied Jesus three times. Stood up. Boldly. Stood up preaching the gospel of Christ. And said, if you want to be saved, you have to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. In other words, if you want to be saved, if you want to have your sins forgiven, you have to be baptized for the remission of your sins. He says, and God will add to you his Holy Spirit. Oh, that word add means join something to something else as to improve its quality. You see, when you are baptized uh, for the remission of your sins, God adds to you his spirit. Now, having the spirit of Christ uh, is probably the most important thing you can have. The Spirit can do things for you. Get money. Spirit will put you in a position that money just can't. The Spirit will give you access to the grace of God. Oh, that's just something money just can't do. Second chapter, we already looked at verses 38 through 47. Look at Acts, the fifth chapter, verse number 32. Acts, the fifth chapter, verse number 32. Oh, having the Spirit of God is invaluable. Verse number 32. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. You see, once you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, God adds to you his spirit. God adds to you the quality, his quality. God adds to you the quality of a much better lifestyle. What can the Spirit do for you? Why is it important to have the quality of life and have the Holy Spirit added to a child of God? Number one, the Spirit of God becomes our intercessor. Look at Romans, the uh, 8th chapter, verses 26 and 27. Remember earlier, I told you that the Spirit of God does things for you that money can't do for you. Look at Romans, uh, the 8th chapter, verses 26 and 27. Romans, the eighth chapter, it reads, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, or to the way. Mm-hmm. 
Romans. I'm sorry, I said Acts. The book of Romans. The book of Romans. Chapter 8. Verses 26 and through 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our firmity. For we know not what we should pray for, as we are. But the Spirit itself make an intercession for us, groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he make an intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Oh, money! cannot make intercession for you. Something that only the Holy Spirit can do. And only those who have obeyed the gospel of Christ have the privilege of having that Holy Spirit. Only those who have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. Only those to whom God has added his spirit to can have that opportunity. Oh, I'm so glad that when I do not know, and I don't know how to exactly word my prayer, I'm so glad that God added to me his Holy Spirit, which will take what my heart needs. Take to the Lord my thought and put this to him in God in such a way that God will hear my needs and will supply my needs according to his riches and to his glory. But only those who have the spirit of God can do that. Oh, when you are baptized, you put to death your flesh. So now God has to add something to you. God gives you his spirit. Oh, and that's the best thing you can have. Point number two, the spirit. Proves that we are God. Look at Second Corinthians, the first chapter, in verse number twenty-two. Second Corinthians, the second chapter, Second Corinthians. The first chapter in verse number 22. Who have sealed us and given earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. When we have obeyed the gospel of Christ, God sends us his spirit to let us know that we are here. Oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. It is our soul, it is our stamp, it is our seal of our salvation, vision. The first chapter in verse number 13. Oh, if you want to feel, if you want to stand, if you want proof that we belong to the Master and that we have been truly purchased with the, with the price and have been bought by the precious and holy blood of the Lamb. Look at 
look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye have heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believe you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, Oh, you have obeyed the gospel of Christ. He adds to you his spirit. But not only does he add to you his spirit, he adds you to his body, adds you to the ecclesia. He adds you to the church. He adds you to the called out body of Christ. He calls you out of the world and calls you into his marvelous life. He calls you into the fellowship of his suffering. He calls you and to have a fellowship with the Son. He calls you into fellowship with the Father. He calls, oh, y'all get the point. Oh, I'm talking about God's math plan. And then you have subtraction. When you become a child of God and you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, that word subtract means to take away value. When you obey the gospel of Christ, God subtracts the penalty of death from your sin. God will no longer hold sin against you. God will remit your sin. God will forgive you of your sin. God will no longer bring up your sin. Subtraction can be good. But it can also be bad. There are those folks out there in the religious world who subtract from the word of God and say that baptism is not essential to salvation. The Bible tells us not to add nor subtract from the word of God. The Bible tells us if you subtract from the word of God, God will subtract from you your name out of the Lamb's book of life. Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verse number 19. Then we have multiplication. Look at 2 Corinthians, the ninth chapter, verses 6 through 8. We are all familiar with those, with that verse, for those of us who are members of the body of Christ. God can do more with a little. You can do with a lot. God is able to multiply what you give. You cannot be God in giving. Look at Luke, the sixth chapter, and verse number 38. The verse number 38. God will take what you have, press it down, and make it overflow. 
that you would not have enough room to receive the blessings of God. The not to multiply just simply means to increase greatly. Oh, if you need evidence, just look at Job. In Job, the 42nd chapter, verses 10 to 12. After Job went through all the years that he went through, after losing his house, his family, uh, all his possessions, God blessed him with more in the end. Why? Because he kept his faith in God. He knew where his faith was. And after he had kept his faith, after he went through his going through, God blessed him with more in the end than he did in the beginning. Oh, look at Joseph. God took Joseph from the pit, from the prison, and he put him. God did for Job, and what God did for Joseph, as long as you keep your trust and faith in him, God says, what I did for them, I can do for you. I am able to bless you more abundantly than you could ever even ask for or imagine according to my riches, according to my glory, God says, I am able to bless you far above what you could even ever ask for as long as you trust me. And then he says, talks about division. The Bible tells us, he says, let there be no division among you. But speak ye all the same thing. Why does God not want division in the church? The Bible tells us that a house divided against itself cannot stand. So if we are going to stand for the Lord, we should not be divided. Because if we are divided, we cannot and will not be able to stand for God. Oh, that is my lesson on this evening. God's basic math plan. We have addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. At this time, I'd like to turn it back over to our good brother. Thank you for your time and your attention. There may be someone that may be going through some trials and tribulations in your life. Your nights are filled with crying eyes, and it may have been that way for a very long time. But sometimes you're wondering what the answer is. Maybe you don't know whether to go left, to go right, to go forward or go back. But sometimes you've just got to get on your knees and fall down pray to Him. You just got to stand still and let God have his way. And watch him work. Watch God work. Watch him make a way. Watch him make a way. And one of these days, God is going to answer your prayers, not on your time, but on his time. 
He is going to make a way for you. Let the church say amen and amen one more time. You'll see a brighter day. Are you going to start your life? And you just don't know how you're going to fight your life. Are you having some dark nights? Oh, so dark that you can't even see the light. See, I've been there. Trust me, I know. Wondering if I'll make it to tomorrow. I don't want to have to go through it again. So let me share what I did. Oh, yeah. What did you do? See, I got down on my knees and prayed. Just for leaving all my worries and all my troubles. His way, yes, Lord. And then by faith, I know I'll see a brighter day. Watch, watch, watch him work. Watch him make watch him. When you make it through your storm, on the other side, see a brighter Bible say your weeping may endure for night, but joy, but joy, it's coming in the morning, can I get a witness, when you make it through? It will be all right. You're listening to What a Word from the Lord with your host, Stevie R. Butler. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4, and we'll look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, and 23 will serve as our lesson text. Now, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4, that there is one body. So we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 22 and 23, and Paul is going to explain to us just what that one body is. He says, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all and in all. And since Paul says in Ephesians 4, 4, that there is one body, that's what we're going to be talking about. On this broadcast this evening, the subject is, is there only one church? That's our subject for this segment of the broadcast. Paul says in Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body. Then he tells us that the one body is the church in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. So we want to look at, is there only one church? That's the question that's on the floor. And this is an extremely pertinent question with a surprisingly simple answer. You know, I've been uh, on social media and in one group there, I'm not going to call any name, but they were dealing with this very question. Is there one church? And that's what we want. that's why I got the idea for doing this lesson because of that conversation on social media. So, so listen to me. Jesus gave a satisfying, simple answer when he replied to Peter in Matthew 16 and verse 16, 
I will build my church. That should settle the matter, ladies and gentlemen. The Lord only built one church, just as he said he would. However, for the rest of this lesson, we wish to ask three questions. Number one, what is a church? Number two, what do we mean by church? And then lastly, number three, how does this affect me? Those are the three points we want to answer from this lesson on this broadcast. Number one, what is the church? Number two, what do we mean by church? And number three, how does this affect me? Ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of confusion over such a simple question. And much of the confusion is simply because church is an ambiguous word in modern English. Many associate church with a building. On some cities in America, there are church buildings on every corner. One needs only open a yellow pages telephone book for one's own town and see several entries under the subsection of churches. Some cathedrals have the most beautiful architecture. However, when 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 Jesus said he would build his church, did he have a cathedral in mind? Well, let's look at the first point that we want to give you from this lesson, and that is, what is a church? Well, let's look at that. What is a church? It should come as no surprise that God did not write the scriptures in modern English. Usually when one reads the English word church, this is a translation of the Greek word ekklesia. And in the first century, ecclesia was a common noun. And Luke used this Greek word referring to an angry mob that was in an uproar against Paul and his teachings in Acts chapter 19. This word was everyday street language in the Greek, the Greco-Roman world. The word ecclesia is a compound noun. That is, it has two components. The first part, ekla, E-K, is a preposition in Koine Greek. It is the same preposition for exodus. It means out of. The second part, kaleo, K-A-L-E-O, is a verb in Koine Greek. It means to call. In a literal translation, an ecclesia was a called out assembly. It never refers to a building. In ancient times, the Greeks had a separate word for the place where an ecclesia met. The ecclesia austerion. In ancient times, city-states called out of the people to assemble for a task. This word would develop in Christian usage. The New Testament writers use this word exclusively 
to refer to the called out saints. With a few exceptions, the apostle Peter wrote that God has called Kaleo, us out of Ekla, darkness into his marvelous light. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It seems that the apostle Peter was making a play on words of ecclesia. However, when used as a compound, we opt for an extra translation, exact translation rather, like assembly or gathering or congregation. God has called us together into one body of darkness for glorifying in him. He has formed us into the into the ecclesia, i.e. church, you see? And which brings us to our second point, and that is what do we mean by church? When we assert there is only one church, we are not asserting that there are not individual congregations. A clear example of this is in the book of Revelations. When Jesus spoke to the seven ecclesias of Asia Minor, he was speaking to seven literal groups. In his Roman letter, the apostle Paul basically wrote, in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, he says the various individual congregations of Christ greet you. However, there is only one church. When we assert there is only one church, we are not talking about church buildings with an exclusive designation as Church of Christ on their sign? The Apostle James used the word synagogue for assembly in James chapter 2 and verse 2, which describes a building designated for worship and instructions called synagogues by the Jews. Thus, we know some first century believers assembled in buildings designated for such. However, it's highly unlikely they had signs for their buildings in the first century. Often, early believers used a fish symbol to signify their meeting places during times of persecutions. Some also met in each other's houses, according to Acts chapter 2 and verse 46. However, there is only one church. When we assert there is only one church, we are not referring to denominations. Indeed, while there are fictitious, uh, fractions uh, in the various congregations, see 1 Corinthians uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, you will see all of that division there in Corinth. The church is not a conglomeration of various groups. We cannot be united until we lay down our interpretations, till we lay down our biases. However, there is only one church. When we say there is only one church, what we mean is that all believers who have responded in faith to the gospel, painting of their sins and being baptized in water, collectively form one group of people, the call out of God. Then the Lord adds those people to his church, Acts 2 and verse 47. These people spend the rest of their days following learning and following the pattern 
of the New Testament, living daily conformed to the Lord's will. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17, which brings us to the last point of our lesson. And that is, how does this affect me? How does this affect me? Ladies and gentlemen, it means that instead of turning to find a church in our yellow pages, we ought to turn in our Bibles, in our New Testament, to find how to be like the church of the New Testament. How do we become part of this one church? We read several conversion stories in the book of Acts. Perhaps the most famous of them being found in Acts chapter 2. When those who had heard the gospel responded in faith by repenting and being baptized in water for the remission of the forgiveness of of their sins, then and only then did the Lord add them to his church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Those who are in the church are people enrolled in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. Jesus Christ our Lord, ladies and gentlemen, is the head of the church and the savior of the body, which is the church. Ephesians 5 and verse 23 in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. Despite giving our various congregations proper names, the one church does not have a fixed proper name. Did you hear what I said? The one church, the Lord's church, does not have a fixed proper name. Many writers attach the scriptures to describe them in the scriptures. Those who belong to the firstborn, namely Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 23, are those who belong to the living God, Acts 20, and verse 28. If one has multiple trees, they might need to differentiate uh, maple trees and elm trees and pine trees. However, the Lord only has one church, so it has no purpose to do that. We must not divide the church. Our society is permeated with denominationalism, the idea that somehow the one church is segmented into smaller denominations like a giant piece of pie. However, the New Testament warns against division. My co-host talked about that in the segment prior to this, that division, whether in petty squabblings or in a larger fictitious way, Jude condemned those who divides us as those devoid of the spirit in Jude 19. Those in Corinth were people of the flesh because they divided. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. They were carnal-minded. Why do we not stop all this denominationalism, this denominational foolishness, and simply be Christians? Be members of of the churches of Christ. Isn't that what Jesus wants? Isn't that what he laid his life down for? To be a Christian only and only Christians. Our Lord desires that his followers that would come to believe in him through the apostles teaching they would all be united. Jesus prayed in John 17, verses 20 through 23, that they all may be one. So in conclusion of our lesson 
on this evening, ladies and gentlemen. A local church is of Christ if it's practicing New Testament Christianity. A local church is of Christ if the membership and the leadership are committed to being Christians only. A local church is of Christ if Christ and his word are the foundation from which they stand. There are plenty of buildings with signs that say a church is of God or of Christ, but their practices say they are not. And there may be churches which do not use the phrase church of Christ on their sign, but they are of Christ because they are trying to follow the New Testament Christianity. A sign does not choose whether a church is of Christ or of the devil. One must conform to the pattern of the New Testament to have salvation in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Ladies and gentlemen, my goal as a Christian is not about figuring out how uh, it's not about figuring out who is saved and who is lost. That's not my goal as a Christian. I have a hard enough time worrying about my own salvation than worrying about other folks' salvation. Amen. My goal as a Christian is to preach the simple message of Jesus Christ, my Lord is teaching the whole counsel of God and to live by faith with simplicity so that when people see me, they will say, that's truly a God-fearing individual. I want to have the kind of faith that lives. Certainly, there are people who have swerved from the truth and whose teaching is gang green upsetting the faith of some, but the Lord knows those who are his. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 23. Ladies and gentlemen, as a Christian, I must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting my opponent's with gentleness, Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. The Lord only built one church, ladies and gentlemen. If you would like to know more about it, the answers are in your Bible, your New Testament. You can read all about it. And I would love for you to send in your questions to the platform we have here on social media, the shout it out platform. And we take those questions and we bring them on to the Gospel Light Radio Show on Thursday. And my co-host, they answer these questions according to the Bible, book, chapter, and verse. That's what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. As a Christian, it's my goal to sow the seed of the kingdom as best I can and continue to study my Bible just like those Bereans in Acts 17 and verse 11. Amen. And I'll see you on the other side of the break. You are the reason I sing, the reason I breathe. Lord, you are the best thing that's happened to me, you are my joy, Lord, you are, Lord, you are, you are the reason I sing, 
the reason I breathe. Lord, you are the best thing that's happened to me. You are my joy. Lord, you are. Lord, you are. You are the reason I praise. The reason I cannot be a child of God until you are a Christian, until you have been born again, as the Bible teaches, then you are lost outside of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not enough to simply be religious. You must obey the commands of the Lord. Don't ever let anybody tell you you don't need to obey God. In order for a man to be saved, you must take heed and answer the gospel call. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. Ladies and gentlemen, you must hear the gospel. John chapter 6 and verse 45. Romans chapter 10 verses 14 and 17. 
and the facts of the gospel are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. You must believe the same. James chapter 2 and verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. And he is reward of them that diligently seek him. Ladies and gentlemen, you must repent. In Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, Jesus Christ, our Lord, said, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Paul says in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, that God commanded all men everywhere to repent. Ladies and gentlemen, you must confess your faith in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Jesus said, if you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my father. You must be baptized in water for the remission of the forgiveness of your sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts 10 and verse 48. 1 Peter chapter 3. And verse 21, and if you are a Christian and you have not been faithful in your service to God, then you can decide again by prayer and repentance, Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. And ladies and gentlemen, we want to encourage you to visit the churches of Christ in your local area. Amen. And I'll see you on the other side of the break. Oh, it's and okay, just sit now. down. Right sit down. Sit down. Let me talk to you. It's been a while, but I know trouble's been the in your life. Well, the devil's trying to mess with you. But God's trying to bless you. Situations yeah. may cause you to question faith. I know you cry and you work. But we came to take you the whole long. Hold on, Try your eyes. Home. I'm a believer. Jesus still delivers. I remember when I was right there. This is what I had to do. I called on you. I prayed. I called on him. I I wasn't worried. That's why I stopped by here to tell you. I 
broadcast in a study of God's word. I want to thank my special guest speaker, Steve Cordo. He did a great job in that first segment. I also want to thank my guest on in the community corner, Chef Brian Brown from Atlanta, Georgia. And I also want to thank my co-host, Edward Bishop. He always does a great job on the broadcast as well. But I want to thank you listeners for tuning in to this broadcast. And I just pray that the things that you heard from this broadcast will be beneficial to your spiritual lives and that your relationship with the Lord is getting a little stronger each day because you're tuning in to this broadcast and you have given yourself over to a study of God's word. So until we meet again, may God continue to bless your lives and bless you real, real good. Good night, everybody. Lord, 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 Lord. You sure been good to me. I said, Lord, 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 you sure been good to me. Pressing on. I'm pressing on. 
what I want to do down here To know and bring the name 